Right. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a meeting of the North Yorkshire Outbreak Management Advisory Board. Um, I'm County Councillor Carl Les, I'm leader of the council, and because of that, I chair this board. Uh, welcome to members of the board and any members of the public or media who may be viewing the meeting. For the particular benefit of members of the public or the media, the main role of this board is to support the effective communication of the test, trace and contain plan for the county and to ensure that the public and local businesses are effectively communicated with. Decisions of the board are purely advisory and its recommendations will be considered through the governance arrangements of the bodies represented, which retain their decision making sovereignty. Papers for this meeting have been published in advance on the County Council's website. The board comprises representatives of the County Council, District and Borough Councils, the NHS, Public Health England, Schools, Health Watch, the Care Sector and the Voluntary Sector, among others. There are some 30 members and officers around the table, so I'm not going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Um, just before I forget, though, I would like to thank David Kerfoot for his attendance at this board and everything else, David, that you've been doing for the county in, in your uh, recent history. Um, I understand that Helen Simpson will be coming in future to represent the views of business and the, and the lab. So, David, thank you for everything that you've done. Can I then move on then, please, Patrick, and ask for apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Apologies have been received from Councillor Keane Duncan, the leader of Rydale Council, and Rydale are represented today by Councillor Steve Arnold, the deputy leader. Also apologies, Chair, from Councillor Anne Myatt from Harrogate, Julian Mulligan, the Police Fire and Crime Commissioner, uh, Amanda Bloor, the Accountable Officer at North Yorkshire CCG, Sue Peckett, the Chief Nursing Officer is here to give the update on the uh, vaccination for the NHS. And finally, Chair from Sally Tyra, who is the Chair of the Yorkshire Local Medical Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Does anybody know of any other apologies that need to be recorded? OK, let's move on then, please, to uh, item three, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest to make? I can't see any hands going up. OK, and can I ask if anybody has any other business that they want us to discuss at the end of the meeting? Again, I can't see any hands going up. So that takes us to the notes of the meeting from the 19th of November. Are people happy with these as, uh, as in terms of the accuracy of the minutes? OK, I'm taking silence as assent. And does anybody have any matters arising? OK, thank you. So now let's move on to item six. Um, one of the main items on the agenda. So the update on the current position. And I think I'm coming straight to Louise for this, am I, Louise? Yes, thank you, Chairman, you are. Thank you. Yep. Um, afternoon, everybody. Louise Wallace here, Director of Public Health for North Yorkshire. And thanks to colleagues who produced this data from our Public Health Intelligence team. Um, Patrick, could I have the next slide? Thanks. Um, as always, we just start by reflecting on the international position. And globally, we now exceed 111 million cases across the whole of the uh, globe, which is quite a staggering figure, really, um, and 2.5 million deaths. And the UK ranks fifth in the league table across um, the globe in terms of cases and deaths. Um, just want to reflect on, Chairman, as we hit the first year, almost of this pandemic across the, the whole of the world. Could I have the next slide, please, Patrick? Um, in terms of cases then, you'll have seen through the media and indeed our local data for North Yorkshire that cases are declining, which is to be absolutely welcomed. But we still had 73,392 cases um, over the past week of, um, uh, of COVID across the UK. And tragically, uh, 2,815 people have died as a result of this virus. So yes, whilst the picture is improving, it's always important to reflect upon um, the deaths that we've seen from this virus. Um, next slide, please, Patrick. Thanks. Um, the, this, uh, the, these two graphs kind of show the cases and the rates uh, visually across North Yorkshire. And it does show that decline that I'm speaking of from that peak that we saw through December. Um, but as you'll see, um, it hasn't absolutely come down as a flat line yet, and it is reducing, thankfully, but still not where we need it to be. Next slide, please, Patrick.
Okay, thank you. This um, slide shows the seven-day infection rate by district. I won't um, read through the slide because I think members have got it in their pack. But as you can see, all districts apart from Richmondshire are beneath the England average. But as is shown on previous slides, the England average has significantly come down over the past few weeks, um, but definitely an improving position, um, but not uh, at all to be complacent about this, um, Chairman. We, we do still need to make sure those rates come down even further, particularly in those localities where we're over the 100 still. Next slide, please. OK, thanks, Chair. Just again, um, Chair, just to reiterate the, the number of deaths, um, there is a slide further on in the pack that shows um, that we have actually gone over the 1,000 deaths across North Yorkshire since the pandemic began. You've probably seen that in the media over recent weeks, and that is indeed a very sad milestone that we have reflected upon with partners across um, the county over the last few weeks. Um, but this graph does show, thankfully, that death rates are decreasing across the county, but again, not to, um, to underestimate the impact of that for families and communities. Um, next one, please, Patrick. OK, and this data just presents what I've just said um, from the ONS. And again, it's nationally available data that um, members can look at. Next one, please, Patrick. Thank you. And that just um, is the data sources of which we draw upon. So I suppose in summary, Chairman, the message today is that the, the, the position is definitely improving. Um, I would like to just stress that we can't uh, be complacent. We're still in national lockdown and so we do encourage people to still follow all of the restrictions and make sure that we do get those case numbers even further down. Just noting that 75 on average cases a day is still up there. And um, I just urge everybody to still continue to follow all of the rules, please, if we can. Um, and I'll just come back to you because so I can see a member has got a hand. Thank you, Louise. Um, Stuart, I can see your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carl. Um, so, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, who feeds into the NHS about their potential uh, practices creating further risks? I'll give you two examples. Uh, somebody who needed a medical exemption card, uh, despite the pandemic, is informed that they must go to the surgery to collect the form, and then they must return the form to the surgery, even though the doctor actually fills it all in. So that's a, an individual who is potentially shielding, who is forced to go twice to a surgery, putting hands on doorknobs, et cetera, that have been recently touched by other people and they don't know whether they're safe. And then the, um, sorry, the second one that I've been given uh, was repeat prescriptions. So your doctor knows whether you need one or not. Um, normally the pharmacy would put one in with your pile of pills, but if they forgot, you actually, according to NHS rules, apparently have to turn up, go into the surgery, make that request, take away a form, bring it back into the surgery again to get it sent down to your pharmacy. So the NHS is actually creating a potential for more infections and the spread of infections, I think unintentionally, but they need it feeding into them that when they look at the lessons learned, that they also need to learn a lot of lessons from the way that they are instructing patients to put themselves in danger. Thank you. Sue, so do, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just to feedback that um, I, will, I will take that away and have a look at it. Um, I'm not aware that we've had it raised to me previously, but I will take it away and um, we'll come back to this group and, and let you know the outcome of that. Yeah, thank you. And if you if you need somebody to speak to about it, speak to me because I've got all the evidence at home. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. So. Any further questions to Louise? Stuart, I think you are, you know, your hand's down now, thank you. Okay, Louise, is there anything else that you want to add? Councillor Collins got a hand up, Chair. All right, sorry. Liz, please. 
thank you. Um, actually, it was response to Councillor Parsons. I am a pharmacist, not practising, but still on the register. Um, a pharmacy will print off the repeat prescription side if for any reason a member of the public doesn't have one, so there is no need to go to the doctors. But I admit there is a need to go to the pharmacy to request that. OK, thank you, Liz, for that information. So, Louise, anything else uh, from you? Uh, not at this point, Chairman. Just the data um, as it stands is there for members to look at. And I know Richard will be speaking about the next steps for the next few weeks in his presentation. OK, thank you. In that case, let's move on to Richard's um, presentation, please, Richard. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Leader and uh, uh, colleagues on the uh, board. Good to be here and uh, thank you for covering this item. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail to, to repeat what the Prime Minister announced on Monday, but we thought that these slides would be helpful. And I know Patrick's going to put those up in a moment. Gives you a summary of all four key stages in quite a easy to use format um, and what's expected at each stage. Clearly, there's a lot more detail anticipated um, and um, we are due to get guidance all of the time. Um, particularly a lot a lot of focus at the moment on schools um, and also on care home visits, which I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a moment. And um, Patrick, I'm not sure whether people can see the slides before I go any further. Richard, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble sharing them. Um, OK, I'll shall I try from my... I'll, I'll yeah, try if not, my, I can ask a colleague yeah. to, to take over. Uh, for OK. OK, I shall see if I can upload them myself. OK, can everyone see those slides now? Not yet. No, not yet. OK. Right, I'll just wait a second until the slides are up. They got them there now, Richard. Yeah, got them now. Yeah, OK. So, um, just as I was saying, the uh, detail here sets out the four tests from the Prime Minister, uh, then sets out step one, uh, step two, step three, and step four. Um, and also a reminder that at this stage, we don't know how some of the uh, wider, but also fundamental measures around prevention and protection, how long they will stay in place. So actually the message about hand, face, and space um, it's certainly probably easy to see a scenario where that could become more commonplace, certainly for the rest of the year. Um, and um, partly because we've raised a massive level of awareness about that, but also they are simple steps that all of us can keep to in terms of keeping ourselves safe as the economy um, opens up. And I think the other thing to say is over the year, we will expect to see a massive shift in how testing operates. So as more people are vaccinated, um, there will be more around a shift towards home testing, test and go for want of a better term, um, to ensure that the economy and society can be opened up. I think it's reasonable to say also that based on the data that Louise and other colleagues have shared in the past and that we've seen from the chief medical officer, that we can expect to have spikes and infection rates that increase at various points. Um, inevitably, we will get that as um, society opens up more and more people have contact. We also will have by the summer um, a, a huge proportion of people vaccinated, and that's thanks to uh, the very good work of our NHS colleagues. So we may be in this dual situation for the next uh, six months or so, where we have increasing numbers of people vaccinated, but we also have periodic spikes and periods when uh, infection rates can still be quite high. So we're beginning to adjust to a situation where we're living both with COVID and beyond COVID. So these uh, steps have been set out um, in response to uh, what the Prime Minister said. We've, we've started to have some initial discussion across uh, agencies about some of the immediate actions. Now, this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but I'll come on to that in a moment. But some of the things, for example, are work between uh, public health and CYPS and schools colleagues about school reopening on the 8th of March. There's an urgent piece of work about um, adjusting the care homes, visiting policies. Um, we have encouraged since the autumn, actually, 
designated visiting for care homes. That changes on the 8th of March to allow indoor visiting. So there's quite a bit of work uh, to be done to support that. And then a mammoth piece of work, I think, through stages two to four, and we need to start preparing for it now around how we gradually open up parts of the economy um, in relation to the roadmap. And that will involve um, ongoing significant work, um, engagement advice and compliance work from environmental health, public health, trading standards, uh, our colleagues in the LEP and other business partners as well. So um, you may remember in, in November, uh, when we were in tiered uh, restrictions and we had soaring rates in Scarborough, we had our highest level of incidents in terms of the incident log. So we had 400 open incidents at one particular time. And I think as the economy opens up, we will see more activity where we're working with uh, partners to control potential outbreaks and manage them down. Another important issue for the coming months also is about managing events. So we know that there'll be a significant start of opening up uh, just before Easter. There'll obviously be events throughout the spring and the summer. Um, and we will need to work uh, really collaboratively to find a, a, a fair and proportionate way through that. We have an established events framework. We need to revise that. Um, good working between the uh, different advisory groups in each district area that's had a very good uh, uh, way of combining both advice and support to businesses and events, but also preventing uh, outbreaks too. And we will need to look at our uh, support to different localities, what that looks like. I know colleagues are looking, for example, at issues such as self-isolation payments at the moment. We will need to evolve the testing system. We're developing currently and rolling out across North Yorkshire A um, critical workers uh, testing system at the moment. Um, as I say, home testing is not that far off and that will probably revolutionise how we um, see the testing regime um, both nationally and locally. And then there's quite a bit of debate about the future of the test and trace system um, and what that will look like, to what extent that remains national and to what extent that becomes local too. I should just uh, say um, in passing that there's been a, a really good piece of regional work, the Yorkshire Roadmap. People may have seen uh, that work um, already and that we can share that if people haven't seen that. Um, and that predated the Prime Minister's announcements and talked about the year in, in three scenarios, basically a, uh, a gradual opening up in the period uh, spring and early summer, a um, more significant opening up of the economy and society during the summer, and then a period in autumn and winter when we're likely to see people having uh, COVID boosters, maybe updated in, uh, vaccinations because of new variants, and also flu uh, planning as well. So that still forms the basis of, of, of some of the work that actually supports uh, the Prime Minister's announcement. This is uh, These are the slides that were taken from um, the North Yorkshire and York uh, Local Resilience Forum. They did a, a session on uh, the roadmap. I'm not going to go through these in any great detail, but you'll see they flag um, those uh, three periods, some of the overarching issues, particularly about how we um, manage that balance between opening opening up, um, thinking about what's changed and how that will look in the future, um, and also <coughs> managing the messaging, because we know there is some uh, message fatigue uh, amongst the public moment of, uh, about some of those issues. And I think obviously a vital issue for us in North Yorkshire is not only how we do that within our own borders, but the issue of uh, you know, people wanting to come and visit North Yorkshire as a place uh, to uh, not only uh, work, but also to have days out and spend their holidays too. So these uh, summaries are available for everyone. Um, the other thing I just want to mention very briefly is uh, some further requirements that are just going to be published by government today. So you may remember one of the first actions of this Outbreak Management Advisory Board was to consider the uh, CONTAIN plan, the Outbreak Management Plan for North Yorkshire. That was signed off and submitted to government uh, back in June, actually. And um, we're being asked to pr produce a revised plan uh, that's just been announced this morning. We're waiting for the guidance, which we're told will be with us by the end of the day. The uh, deadline for that is likely to be in mid-March, so it's a fairly rapid turnaround, and I'm conscious that we have a um, 
you know, that may be before the next meeting of, of this particular board. So I wanted to formally propose, um, and I apologise, this is uh, last minute, but we've only just had the announcement. I wanted to propose that we, uh, first of all, work on uh, an updated and revised contain plan, and we do that with our partners across the local resilience forum and beyond. Secondly, that we um, develop a, a draft which we share with members of this board for comments and views within a, an agreed deadline. And thirdly, that we agree that there's a delegated decision for the um, chair and vice chair of this uh, board in conjunction with the director of public health and anyone else whom the guidance may stipulate to sign off that plan and submit it to uh, government when, when that's required. So uh, that's just the only issue for approval, if I may, uh, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks, can, can we deal with that then uh, straight away, folks? I mean, that seems to me to be a very practical um, and pragmatic way of uh, of dealing with the timescale that we're faced with. I mean, we're not a decision making body, but can we come to a consensus decision on that? I'm not seeing anybody putting a hand up to object. I think that makes sense, Carl. Yeah, thank you, Michael. OK, as I say, I can't see anybody objecting to it. So, uh, Richard, we will proceed on that uh, on that basis. So now can I just open it up for any questions to Richard on the other parts of his uh, of his report on the roadmap? David, please. Um, yes, thank you for that, Richard. I just want to ask about the um, critical workers scheme uh, rollout. Um, is that going to include um, people who work with special needs? And I'm particularly thinking here of there's quite a few third party organisations and charities. I'm indeed involved with a couple who work uh, daily with um, special needs and whether or not that critical workers scheme will cover um, early vaccinations for the members of staff therein involved. Uh, thank you uh, for that question, David. And, and first of all, I'd like to thank all of the those organisations that are providing uh, so much vital support. There are several several angles to this, actually. Another I may bring other colleagues in as well. So the community testing scheme is about initially about testing for uh, rapid LFD testing for those people who don't work for the NHS or social care and aren't covered by the existing testing regime. So, for instance, it includes police, fire crematoria workers um, and refuse collectors, amongst others, but those are the main groups. Um, we're likely to see, the government has already announced uh, that it's planning to introduce uh, LFD testing for any business or organisation with more than 50 employees. Mm. Um, that's been announced publicly. The distribution systems aren't quite in place, but we're expecting that to happen fairly quickly. And then, um, probably by Easter, maybe a bit later, we think home testing will be fully in place. That's already obviously being rolled out in some parts of uh, the community already, and um, particularly thinking about schools and parents, um, but also uh, we're expecting that to become more universal for the whole population within the coming weeks. It needs to have regulator uh, approval, but then I think it will become fairly commonplace. In, in terms of um, specific organisations who are working with people with special needs. I'd probably have to ask offline if you're happy to send me some details of those organisations, we can check what they might be eligible for. Um, some will be covered by, I mean, quite a lot of the care sector is already covered by routine testing, um, both PCR testing and LFD testing. If they're not able to get access to that, then we can look into it and, and see what we can do to help. On the issue of vaccinations, um, all health and social care workers have been a priority for vaccination. Um, and in fact, we've just reissued comms with our NHS colleagues this week, telling people to book on to uh, the vaccination line to get their vaccines if they're eligible. There is an issue about some uh, organisations where people work with um, children or young people. They haven't, you know, children and young people 
unless they're clinically extremely vulnerable, aren't on the priority list in quite the same way as other groups of the population. It started with that the, the, the drugs are licensed to prevent death amongst particularly older people and then people who are clinically vulnerable. So if, if you don't fit into that category, you're likely to be further down the, the, the pecking order for vaccinations. Um, but again, if you've got particular concerns, I'm sure uh, Louise, Sue Peckett and I would be happy to look into those um, if you want to uh, drop me a line, we can we can I can share that with people and we can follow up. Thank you, Richard. Any any other questions then, please? I can't see any hands. I don't know if uh, Louise or Sue wanted to comment further, Chair, on on those issues. OK, thank you, Richard. Louise, first, any comments? No, just happy to happy to look into that. And uh, just in terms of the LFD testing, um, we do have a director of public health uh, swabs that we can deploy should we need to do so. So certainly happy to look at that. Um, we have a panel that meets three times a week looking at eligible businesses. So happy to follow that up. Um, thank you. Thank you, Louise. And Sue, anything from you? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to re-echo what Richard and Louise have said, but also in relation to vaccination, we do have to follow the JCVI guidance and there are strict criteria about who is eligible. We have had a lot of challenge to that, but we are um, doing our very best to adhere to those so that we get the rollout as smoothly and widely as we can, as quickly as we can. Thank you, Sue. So if there's no further questions, to Richard. I think that takes us into the vaccination item of item eight. So again, so am I coming to you for this? Yes, you are, Chair. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, so yeah, we continue to make really good progress with the vaccination programme, both nationally and locally. And I'd like to uh, record my thanks to all that have been involved in that local delivery and the organisation of the programme. It's been uh, a huge task to do and um, Everyone who I've met that is involved with it has done it with great joy. So nationally, we uh, know that there's been more than 18 million doses administered. And in North Yorkshire, in the Vale of York, as of half past six this morning, we've delivered 251,690 first doses. And they are mainly being delivered via our local vaccination sites. As I've just said, we're complying with the um, JCVI guidance on the vaccine rollout, and we have administered first doses to over 95% of the North Yorkshire population aged 70 and above by the deadline of the 15th of February. And second doses will be due uh, within 12 weeks. The first ones of those are commencing next week. Uh, a reminder that those who are in the top four priority cohorts who have not initially uh, come forward for vaccination for whatever reason, be that um, confidence in the vaccine, access to the vaccine, or indeed if they've been COVID positive in the previous uh, 28 days of offer, it's not too late for them. They can still be vaccinated and we would encourage those people to come forward uh, primarily through the uh, national vaccination booking line, which will use the uh, larger sites but if anyone is unable to access them, we can still accommodate them in our local sites. We have now moved into our further cohorts in the priority list. So cohorts five and six, which are those that are over 65 and those with an underlying condition that makes them more at risk for serious illness and hospitalisation. And for these cohorts, GPs are calling them in order of priority so um, we will be calling for people to come forward those that are over 65 will have or will be or will have received a letter inviting them to book in at the large vaccination sites um, if they are within a 45 minute travel period if that is difficult for them to do then they can still come to the local sites and we can make arrangements for them to attend there We've now been um, set some further national targets by the government, which you'll have seen, including the offer of a first vaccination to everyone over the age of 50 by the 15th of April and um, every adult by the 31st of July. And we are working towards those targets. So that is a, a large target to hit. 
And because of that, we're having to look at widening our offer of vaccination. So nationally, expressions of interest have been called for from community pharmacies to participate in the wider vaccination administration. And those expressions are starting to come in now. And locally, we will be reviewing those expressions of interest to be able to look at um, improving access across the locality. Um, we do know that there are some individuals who have not received their vaccinations yet and there for a number of reasons. And we do continue to share the messages with our community about the safety of vaccines and that they have been vigorously tested prior to being approved for use. And therefore, we continue to encourage anyone who's invited for a vaccination to come forward and have that vaccination. And we've met this morning with colleagues from North Yorkshire and York Public Health and NHS England to plan on how we engage with the harder to reach groups. So that's a piece of work that um, we're starting and Louise is on the call who um, shared that meeting today about how we uh, further outreach. But as the vaccination numbers start to go up, it's really important that we remind people once again that they have to still follow appropriate behaviours after vaccination. So even if people have had their vaccine, they must continue to follow the government guidance about hands, face and space. We don't have the full picture yet on how um, transmission may still occur after vaccination. So it's important that the social distancing is picked up and a reminder that vaccines do need a second dose and may in the future need a booster. So we will continue to engage with the public and um, ask for their cooperation. And I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to give you this update today. Thank you, Sue. Um, questions to Sue then, please. Or oh, Louise, you want to uh, add something, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sue, for, for highlighting that this morning that we did meet. Um, as a council, we've got a statutory duty to protect the health of the population and vaccination is one of the ways in which we do that. So meeting with um, Chief Nurse colleagues this morning is an important part of that assurance and making sure the uptake is good across the whole of the county. And as Sue quite rightly says, people who might not naturally come forward for vaccination, making sure we reassure them and making sure that they get access to the vaccines is really key. That'll link into the work that Amanda Blore does as responsible officer for the Humber Coast and Vale for vaccination. So I just want to give assurance to this board that the County Council is very much um, at the heart of this, ensuring vaccination uptake, linking in with Amanda and Sue and working collaboratively together to make sure we get that good vaccination uptake. Thank you, Louise. That's reassuring. Anybody got any questions then to Sue? I can't see any hands up. So let's move on then to the next item, to communications. And Michael, I'll come to you, please. Thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Mike James. I work for the communications team at North Yorkshire County Council, uh, but also work as part of the wider uh, multi-agency LRF communications group as well. So let me um, share these slides with you. OK, so um, as per the previous few meetings, I think it's useful just to give um, some context as to what drives the COVID communications response work. Uh, so this slide sets out what we're trying to achieve, uh, basically using communications to directly support efforts to reduce the spread of the virus and to ensure people have the support and information they need to help themselves and those around them. And then these are the working principles for communications activity. So the previous slide was the what we want to achieve. This really is how we want to achieve uh, the, those things. So I've covered these in a lot more detail at previous uh, meetings, so I won't dwell on this on this slide too much. Uh, suffice to say, though, to remind you that communications work is coordinated via the multi-agency LRF communications group. Uh, so this helps to ensure a consistent approach for the communications activity across all the different organisations involved in the response. Uh, this for the County Council has been supplemented by some more localised material where that's appropriate, but again, often delivered in partnership with other organisations as well. And working in that sort of partnership way for communications gives us a much uh, greater audience reach and also greater resilience and pooled resources uh, for the communications work. So here's uh, an overview of some of our recent activity. Um, as you'd expect, we've been supporting the national lockdown messaging on all our channels. Um, 
We've also set up a, a new approach uh, over recent uh, weeks and months to ensure that the latest NHS messages about the vaccine rollout can be amplified by all of the LRF communication partners. So each week uh, we get from our NHS comms colleagues the latest key messages uh, and we all work together to maximise the reach of those key messages about the vaccine rollout. Uh, we've continued with our um, proactive media engagement, which includes the ongoing weekly LRF press conferences, which continue to prove popular, I think, with our media colleagues. Uh, this month, there's been a strong focus on proactive media work around uh, half term. So, for example, trying to discourage people from travelling and also offering support to parents, uh, many of whom, if they're anything like me, will be looking forward immensely to the 8th of March. <laughs> Um, then we've continued with our uh, display advertising and radio advertising, um, so that continues to uh, be some of the core marketing activity that we've got. Uh, and a recent uh, key part of our, our work has been around signposting people for mental health support as well. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that this lockdown has felt very different to some of the others that we've faced um, as it's happened during the, the darkest months and after nearly a year of disruption, although today's sunshine obviously helping to cheer us all. Um, so we've been supporting our mental health, um, uh, supporting mental health uh, uh, communication through various uh, various channels that uh, the LRF partners have got. Uh, likewise for family support as well. So uh, I mentioned a moment ago about our press work to help give um, help and advice to families. I think it has been a really tough time for many parents struggling work and homeschooling and all the uncertainty that brings. So that's been a key focus of our work over recent weeks as well. So as I've done at previous meetings, uh, I've just included, included some visual examples of some of the things we've been working on. So you can see some of our support here around mental health. Um, we continue with our daily updates on the numbers that gets a lot of engagement uh, online. Uh, some examples there of our uh, digital advertising, which is specifically targets areas where we know there have been issues. And then on the following slide, uh, some further examples to give you a flavour of some of the work over the recent, over recent weeks. Um, I just wanted to talk about vaccine comms for a moment. Um, so supporting the NHS vaccine rollout has been a real priority for us uh, for obvious reasons over recent weeks. Um, so we have our weekly updates with NHS communication colleagues from which we're able to uh, roll out a set of key messages that can be used by all partners, all LRF partners. Um, so these key messages have been focusing on managing demand uh, and countering misinformation. Um, and um, we've uh, included some um, some information this week on uh, raising awareness of how people who may have initially decided against getting the vaccine may still have uh, may have still got an opportunity to receive the jab. Um, so that's been one of the key focuses for this week. I just teased ahead there accidentally, but this is our look ahead to the uh, to the next few weeks. So one of the key things that we've been working on over recent weeks is the potential that at some point we may have to. Uh, engage in what's known as surge testing. So from a communications point of view, we've created a pack of material that we can roll out to help deliver the surge testing. Uh, and this includes residents, direct mail letters, social media material, uh, material that our partners can share and use so they can be our advocates in telling the story. Uh, not forgetting staff comms as well, so as many people could be directly affected or know or work in areas that are directly affected. Uh, then, of course, we've got the uh, changes to lockdown comms. So we've been updating this week our entire set of baseline messages to move the story on. Um, so we've been moving the narrative from telling people what the rules are to encouraging people to keep going. And, and I think, as Richard mentioned in his update, actually, I think that's going to be a real, real challenge um, over the over the coming weeks um, as people can see a way out. And actually uh, uh, continuing to abide by the rules is uh, is really important communication challenge for us. And something else that Richard mentioned as well, of course, is message fatigue. And we need to be really mindful of the fact that we need to keep refreshing the story um, that we are telling. Vaccine communications uh, continues um, in partnership with our NHS comms colleagues. Uh, and then I think it's really important for us to, to have an eye on recovery as well, both social and economic recovery. So we've got a number of campaigns uh, around these themes that are, are shaping up at the moment. So there's a long term what we call Team North Yorkshire campaign, which looks to highlight the work of volunteers in North Yorkshire and build on some of the community spirit that uh, we've seen over the past 12 months or so. And also our buy local support for local businesses too. Which brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mike. Any questions, please, to uh, to Mike? Nope. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Mike. Uh, 
clearly one of our key uh, key roles is to make sure the communications are being done effectively. So that's reassuring to note. Okay, let's move on then to uh, item 10 and the uh, verbal updates and I'll run down the list. David, anything from you? Yeah, um, thank you, Chair, if I may. Uh, just three or four short points. Um, firstly, we feel through our Growth Hub and Helplines that the um, roadmap has definitely been uh, well received by business and really raised um, the spirits with business owners over the week. It's been a, a very positive week from that, that perspective. Um, <clears throat> one concern for me is that most aren't considering if things don't happen as quick as that, not before uh, dates on the roadmap. Um, so that is a little bit concerning, but in the main, it's been a um, hugely positive week. Secondly, uh, really pleased to report that we're hearing um, big things from self-catering and camping based tourism. They're getting um, record bookings this last week, although the hotel and B&Bs is not quite as, uh, as, as fast on the pickup. Um, thirdly, I think overall hospitality is really welcoming the pathway to start planning. Um, it's really essential for them to get away from this stop-start um, scenario for the businesses. And uh, one of the things that was causing them huge issues was supply chains, which um, I think we'll need um, a lot of further work uh, and help and support from ourselves on. And then finally, um, bearing in mind the Chancellor's speech next week, some of, some industries obviously across our patch will need continued support as in reality it's going to take them um, a lot longer than 12 months um, to rebound and to recover. One good example of that we're hearing about is that wedding venues are completely booked out for 2022 but as you can imagine, in 2021, it's very, very uh, quiet and the opposite. Um, and also, interestingly, we have some very good um, uh, businesses across our patch who rely on aerospace in particular, in, in, implying supports and, and different um, elements for that. And there again, that is a, a good example of how um, those types of businesses are probably going to take years to rebound rather than months. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, David. Interesting what you were saying about the hospitality uh, business. I was at a Welcome to Yorkshire board meeting yesterday, and I have to say that uh, our intelligence yesterday was that residential is now starting to catch up on self-catering. So I, th I think that is good news for that uh, that sector. Can we move on then to the care sector? I don't know if it's Mike Padgham with us this morning. Anybody else from the care sector? Do you want me to just do a bit of an update? Please, uh, if you would, Richard. Uh, so uh, the situation remains um, is improving, um, but remains uh, a significant issue for the care sector. So first of all, I mean, I think to thank everybody across the sector who's working so hard to to protect and support people. Um, we have uh, seventeen thousand. Uh, we think uh, the national figures are a bit. Uh, variable but 17,000 care workers across North Yorkshire high levels of vaccination which is good news a really strong push by NHS colleagues and uh, council colleagues in partnership with uh, the ICG so that's good news as far as I can tell we have higher than the national average of, of take up and we continue to push that and um, in terms of outbreaks we have um, 235 care settings uh, 54 of those have one or more cases um, now in the high 20s, it's fluctuating each day of those that have outbreaks. So outbreaks in their 14 day period, that is. So that's an improved position uh, through most of January and February. The comparators have been that we've had uh, 70 or 80 uh, homes with one or more cases. And we've had uh, up to uh, 50 um, hot outbreaks in, at some point during that period. So that's a much improved position. The number of uh, uh, residents and staff affected is in the low 70s. It does fluctuate day by day. Uh, yesterday, and this is one bit of good news that we just need to hold on to, we had no new cases in care settings. That was the first time since the 7th of October, uh, which was good news. Uh, I can't guarantee that every day, but actually I think sometimes you just have to hold on to the, the bits of good news. 
Um, there are some significant issues going forward. So uh, you'll be aware that uh, in North Yorkshire, ahead of the government's uh, designated beds policy, um, we actually had safer discharge beds in the first uh, wave of the pandemic. Uh, we continued that with designated beds. Um, there is an insurance scheme that government announced for providers. Uh, we have put arrangements in place with some of our providers for that. I have to say some challenges around that in that the scheme ends at the 31st of March. So as with other places, we're, we're sort of asking government to extend that for a longer period because it is a big issue for the care sector. Um, and obviously there are some significant issues going forward. The new white paper um, makes some potential changes which retain the pandemic response in the care sector for a longer period. Um, that has um, some opportunities. It also has some funding requirements. So uh, we will be working with partners on that issue. So uh, those are probably the main points from the care sector. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Can I move on to Health Watch, please? Ashley, are you with us? Yeah, hi, hello. Um, but it's just a really very, very brief feedback that we're getting really, uh, it's really positive feedback from the people who you know, around the vaccines, the people who are going to the vaccine centres, um, saying that the, the staff are really uh, um, helping them, supportive, professional. So that's really, that's, it's really, really good to hear. And, you know, and echoes what Sue has, has, has been saying. So that's really good for us to get that positive feedback. The only, I suppose, the only small issues we're still getting is this confusion between um, you know, people having the, the, the national invitation by the government to go to the, 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 the national centres. And then obviously they're not realising that if they if they can't make you know a national centre or it's too far away that they if they wait they will then you know be invited by their you know by their local GP. So we, we so we're, we're still informing people about that. I'm not sure how we get around that, um, but we're still getting people who are a little bit confused um, about that. But in general, I mean our queries have 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 gone down a lot. So the, you know, so so I can take that the people are, are you know are a lot a lot happier and definitely happy when they you know when they receive the. Uh, vaccines. Okay, thank you Ashley. Perhaps we can pick that point up as part of the comms um, agenda. Can I move on then to local government? Any of my local government colleagues want to uh, make a contribution? Okay, NHS, Sue, anything to add? Uh, thank you Chair. Sorry I lost internet connection so I've had to join back on my phone so you can't <laughs> see me but um, just to pick up on, on what Healthwatch were just saying there, uh, the local NHS services don't have any um, control over the national letters. In fact, we don't always know when they're going to be sent out, but we have escalated up to the national team about um, making sure it is clear in those letters that if people are unable to travel the distance to a site that we um, can vaccinate them locally. And the only other um, update from uh, NHS is that whilst the COVID inpatient numbers are decreasing, the hospitals do still remain very busy. And this is traditionally the busiest time of the year for our NHS services. So we do still ask people to attend A&E only if absolutely necessary. But all NHS services are open as business as usual. OK, thank you, Sue, for that. Um, police, Lisa, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, very briefly linked to some of the uh, conversations we've already had today. Um, the vaccination programme uh, is probably encouraging people to feel a little safer. Uh, the weather is picking up uh, and people can see some of the lockdown rules starting to ease as we move forward with the next uh, key date, obviously after schools being the 29th of March, that gives people that little bit more freedom. Uh, and it's just the urge really from the police to to encourage people to continue to abide by by the rules during this next four weeks we know it's going to be difficult for our communities but i don't think any of us would want to see an increase in those infection rates as a result of people uh, moving around a lot more anticipating those changes and we have seen since the start of lockdown um, more and more people moving around, getting together indoors predominantly, and also being outside of their home addresses for the non-essential reasons. So just it is that final push in this, this next coming period as the weather improves uh, to really um, make that effort to stick to the rules for uh, the health and well-being of all of our communities. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> 
um, the uh, Julia's not with us this morning, so let's move on to Public Health England then, please. Anything from PHE? No? Okay. Schools, Ian, anything from you? Yes, just briefly, if that's all right. Um, as uh, members of the board will be aware, schools are currently open to nursery, vulnerable pupils and children of critical workers only, uh, with other students currently learning by remote offer. Uh, primary schools reopen to all students on the 8th of March. Uh, secondary schools will reopen from the 8th of March according to their logistics, whereby they need to offer students a lateral flow test first on site and year groups will return following their first negative test. Secondary students will then commence home testing after three on site lateral flow tests. Secondary staff will also move to home testing this term as primary staff are already doing so. And supplemental to this, schools are currently preparing contingency plans against a revised framework that was also issued to schools on the 22nd of February. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. And then uh, finally, can we move to the voluntary and community sector? And Leah, have you anything to add? Um, just to say that the sector is continuing to support people who need a helping hand. And also we've got plenty of volunteers helping to steward at vaccination centres. So a thank you to all those volunteers and to the charities and community groups that are doing that work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Leah. Right, can we just note all those updates, please? Um, the next meeting is on Monday the 29th of March and at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, there's been no other business notified at the start of this meeting. So I'll bring this meeting to a close. And until we meet again, let's all keep safe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.